So now we're going to talk about how to compute the Fibonacci series. It seems like a very simple process. You learned about Fibonacci in grade school. Uh, but it turns out that if you try to use a naive strategy for computing the Fibonacci numbers, you end up getting an exponential time algorithm, which is not good. We can get a linear time algorithm. That means to compute the n Fibonacci number, it runs uh, on the order of n time uh, using a slightly smarter dynamic programming trick. We'll see how that works. So now let's think about how to compute the Fibonacci numbers. Just to remember, the Fibonacci numbers are start as 0, 1, 1, 2, 3, 5, 8, 13, and so forth. Um, but uh, as you probably recall, the way you uh, define the Fibonacci numbers is f of 0 is 0, f of 1 is 1, and then um, for any uh, larger n, f of n equals f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2. Right? That's the standard definition of Fibonacci numbers. You just add up the last two terms to get the nth term. Now what we're going to do is define some pseudocode that computes the Fibonacci numbers using one attempt. Um, I'm actually not going to use pseudocode. I'm going to use Python. Um, it's my favorite pseudocode. OK, here's my pseudocode. Notice the first line. It checks if n is equal to 0, one of the base cases, in which case it just returns 0. Then it checks if n equals 1, and then in which case it returns 1. Otherwise, it's going to uh, return um, fib of n minus 1 plus fib 1 of n minus 2. Notice it makes two recursive calls to fib 1 to, to compute this, right? And it's very natural, given the above formula, um, that we would do this. Let's now think about how to compute the running time of fib1. Um, by running time, we generally mean like the number of steps the algorithm takes. And of course, a step isn't always super well defined because you have different machine architectures. But typically, we mean a unit operation of the computer. So now let's let t of n be the running time uh, of computing the n Fibonacci numbers using this fib1 operation. We'll notice that uh, t of 0 uh, it takes about one step, right? Because if you think about this algorithm, um, computing t of 0 requires checking is n equal to 0. That will return true. And then we'll return the number 0. That takes about one step. Um, we could say on the order of one step, let's just say it takes one step. t of uh, 1 equals um, two steps, right? Because when you input 1, first you have to check if n equals 0, then you return 0. Then you check if n equals 1. That returns true. And then so you return 1. So it takes about two steps, right? Um, and so for n bigger than 1, t of n actually equals um, t of n minus 1 plus t of n minus 2 um, plus, let's say, 3. Now, where am I getting 3 from? Well, notice that it has to do uh, this operation here. It has to do this operation here. And then it has to compute fib 1 of n minus 1, which is where this, uh, this, this t of n is coming from. t of n minus 1 is coming from, right? This guy right here is coming from this call. Uh, this t of n minus 2 is coming from this call, right? And the 3 here comes from the fact that we have one operation we check first, another operation, and then we have to add these two, um, these two terms together, and that's a third operation. I'm going to call that a step of the algorithm. So this is my formula, roughly speaking. This is, this is a decent formula for an estimate of the running time of fib1. Okay, now let's dive deeper into this running time calculation, t of n. Recall that, so as I just wrote in the last slide, t of 0 equals 1, t of 1 equals, uh, this should be 2, um, and t of n equals 3 plus t of n minus 1 plus t of n minus 2. Now, the question is, how big does this grow as n gets large? That's the, the, the question we want to answer now. Um, so one thing you'll notice is that this looks a little bit familiar. Um, it looks similar to what we, uh, when we actually computed the actual Fibonacci sequence. The actual Fibonacci sequence, if you remember, we said f of 0 equals 0, f of 1 equals 1, um, and f of uh, n equals um, f of n minus 1 plus f of n minus 2. Now, I'm going to make a claim. The claim is that um, t of n is always bigger than uh, f of n, right? Just given these two expressions. Now, why is that? Well, <laughs> I guess this can be proven using uh, induction. 
So I'll, uh, I'll, I'll just write uh, proof is an exercise. Just have to check um, kind of the base case and then the recursive step. But the key thing here, key thing to note is that um, you'll notice that um, you know, t of n looks very similar ex to this f of n uh, recursive expression, except that t of n has this three here, right? So it definitely is getting larger. Not only does you adding the last two terms, but you're getting larger with that three. So we know that t of n is um, is, 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 is going to be larger than f of n, right? Um, and in fact, we can also, if you want to, we can also write um, that t of n um, equals um, omega of f of n, if you like. So um, how fast does f of n grow? Well, you might not know this, but it turns out that we know that asymptotically, um, so for large n, f of n is roughly, we call phi to the n all over the square root of five. What's phi? Phi um, is the golden ratio. Um, you can look up the golden ratio if you like um, on your own time. It's an interesting quantity, comes up all over the place. Um, of course, uh, it's defined as um, the square root of five plus one all over two, right? But the key thing here is that f is f grows. Um, I should write roughly. This isn't exact. It roughly, it'll asymptotically converge to that quantity, um, but it grows exponentially. And we don't have to talk about here why that why that's the case. Um, but just uh, believe me that f of n grows exponentially. So if f of n grows exponentially, that means that t of n also grows exponentially because f t of n is growing more quickly than f of n, or at least it's larger than f of n, right? So um, running time of um, fib one is thus exponential in n, right? Which is bad, which is a bad thing. That seems a little bit funny, right? Um, exponential growth can get obviously very large, it seemed when I was calculating this before on the paper that that wasn't what was happening. That um, the Fibonacci, that that the time it took me to compute the nth Fibonacci number seemed to be linear in the number of steps. So what's going on here? Somehow there's a bug, right? There's some kind of a bug going on here. So let's talk about um, what the what the what the challenge is. The issue here, of course, is that in order to compute Fib one of n, right? I had to compute Fib one of n minus one and fib one of n minus two, right? I had to go and do these subtasks recursively, right? Now, let's think about how this, this tree continues. So now notice that to compute fib one of m, if you look look down the tree of recursive calls that we had to, to do, you'll notice a lot of repetition. For example, look, fib one of n minus four, just how I've drawn it, there's one, two, three, so over here, four, five, and there's actually more calls as well, right? So I was repeating the call to fib one of n minus four multiple times. I had to, I, I computed that multiple times. I didn't need to do that, right? I can record that computation and save it for later when I need to access it again. So this recursion is, 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 is blowing up in ways that it doesn't need to. We can be a little bit smarter about how we compute this thing. Okay, so now let's try another method using what's called dynamic programming. Dynamic programming is an algorithmic strategy for solving a big problem by reducing it to smaller subproblems, especially where the subproblems overlap with each other. So you can remember having solved other subproblems, kind of like our recomputation of t of n minus four. So let's look at the, uh, um, let's write some pseudocode for this new strategy, and we're gonna call it fib2. We're gonna, well, uh, I'm gonna use my favorite pseudocode, which is Python. Okay, so the first thing that fib2 is going to do is it's going to um, first check if n is zero or one, just using some Python shorthand here. And then it's gonna return n, obviously, if uh, because f of n is uh, for the first and second Fibonacci number, the zeroth and first, or, um, you, uh, a Fibonacci sequence is just the index, right? Zero and one. Um, then it's gonna create this blank array, right? It's gonna create a blank array. This isn't, okay, this isn't Python code. Blank array is not a Python term, but let's just say I can initialize an array um, of size n plus one. Um, okay, so, the first thing we do is we initialize the array with the first two Fibonacci numbers, zero and one. And the next thing we do is this uh, iterative procedure where we start from i going from two to n plus one. 
and we fill in the value of i is the value of uh, uh, the value of f at i is the value of f at i minus one and the value of f at i minus two. And of course, you're guaranteed to have already completed these these quantities, right? Because um, you already computed the Fibonacci series um, up to, but not including the previous i, right? You already did it for one, two, up to i minus one. So these things will already be, are already be filled in. And you'll notice the way that we've done this here, you won't actually repeat um, computation of, let's say, f of i minus two. You won't have to recompute this. This isn't making a recursive call. It's looking up the value that was already computed in this array. The last thing we do is just return f of n, and that's the output. Okay. Now we need to think about how to compute the running time of this algorithm, the number of steps it takes. Okay, so the first line of this algorithm is, is an O of 1 operation. It takes O of 1 operations, right? A constant number of operations. It has to check if n is 0 or 1. Otherwise, it returns n if, it, in, in, if that holds true, right? But if n is bigger than 1, um, then it has to initialize this blank array. There's a question about what data structure you're going to use to initialize this array. It can take O of one time. It can take O of n time. Let's just big give a give a rough upper bound. We'll say this takes O of n time, um, O of n operations to initialize an array. Let's say it does it the slow way. Okay, the next uh, line in this code uh, is to just initialize the first two values. Again, this takes O of one operations, O of one, o of one steps, right? Because it's just has to fill in two values in the array. Nothing scaling with n here. And then we have. Uh, uh, you have to do a loop that has roughly, uh, I think it's n minus one um, iterations um, of this uh, uh, O of one operation, right? The O of one operation is looking up the previous two values, adding them together, and then filling that into the ith value of the array. It has to do that uh, n minus one times, an O of one operation. Therefore, in total, right, this takes O of n time, right? O of n minus one, O of n minus one is also O of n, right? Um, and this, of course, is an O of one operation. So in total, we have an O of 1 plus an O of n plus an O of 1 plus an O of n plus an O of 1. That's still on the order of n, right? This is just O of n. The running time of this algorithm is linear in n. The key takeaway here is that the recursive strategy, Fib1, it seemed very nice and simple, but it has a computational blow up, exponential blow up in the running time um, because it doesn't efficiently use uh, computation in the right way. This dynamic probing solution, which tries to reduce the problem of computing a, a, the nth Fibonacci number to previously solve subproblems and then solve them iteratively one by one, one, by one that's, that's what we call generally dynamic programming, um, is much more efficient and is a linear time strategy for computing the nth Fibonacci number.